This is the sound of the Kalahari Bushmen. I first heard it 20 years ago, and it's haunted me ever since. It was so different from my own music that I decided someday I would have to go to the Kalahari and meet these people. I wanted to find out if there was a connection between their music and the music of my own culture. I come from a different world. My name's Yo-Yo Ma. I'm a cellist, and for me, music making is a formal thing. Most of my life is spent touring the world's concert halls, but not in Africa. It's not on the circuit for most Western musicians. This journey to the Kalahari bush would be something of a personal quest. I was hoping to learn from these people, find out where their music comes from, why they play it, and whether I would find any common ground between us. Before starting out, I needed some kind of reassurance. So I went to see Sir Lawrence van der Post, the historian and philosopher who probably has a greater understanding of the spirit of the Bushmen than anybody else. I wanted to know what he thought I might find and how I should prepare myself. Well, I, I do believe that uh, um, in music you'll find the same confirmation, the same common ground, the same continuity that I find in stories in them, because th they love music. They had uh, musical instruments, and uh, I can't tell you how many varieties, but they sang too, and they danced, and they uh, clapped with their hands, and they would sing to the dance, and sometimes they would play to the dance, and there was a, a wonderful a sort of first heartbeat of music in everything that they did. Uh, so um, their whole music had a gr just as great a place in their life and arts as it has with us. How do you think I should prepare myself to, to go there? In this I don't think you need any preparations except the preparations for a journey. Treat it as a happening. And your weapon is your music. Wonderful, wonderful instrument for communicating. I think you just have to play to them for a few nights or a few days and they make them listen to you and something will happen. I had tremendous fears about actually coming here. Um, some of the fears come from the fact that it's you're going into some place you don't know. You don't have telephone communication with home. You're afraid of snakes. You're afraid of dying. I was afraid of not coming back. I think that's um, it's an irrational fear. Another fear. I think is actually a, even a greater one was the fear of looking for something that you don't know necessarily exists. I'm not a musicologist. I am not an anthropologist. I'm not a poet. So what am I doing? And I think what finally made me really go for it is the sense that, that as a professional musician, I feel that the role of a musician 
um, is there to explore the human psyche. All the emotions, good, bad, terrible, fears, uh, evil, and, and I think that it's part of one's education in, as a musician and as in life to, uh, to go find out. And if there's nothing there, I would know. If I, if I know that that's as far as I can go in myself, I also know something about myself. Um, so it's, in that sense, it's a very much a personal journey. Oh, this is yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. If the cello were going to be my musical means of communication, I needed a linguistic one as well. Richard Lee is a Canadian anthropologist and one of the few people to have spent a lot of time with the Bushmen. He first came here 30 years ago with my anthropology professor, Irvin DeVore, and his knowledge of their culture and their complicated language of click sounds is second to none. Yeah. Well, there's all this animation uh -huh. is that one of the news uh, events of the village was that this poor little kid uh, burned down the tree house. <laughs> nobody was hurt. Nobody was hurt. But, uh, and so they were commiserating and say, well, you know how it is with kids. They don't know anything. Mm. Yeah. He was pretending to, you know, to, 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 play, you know, to light a match and then got stuck in. Into the, uh, into the facts, and, yeah. and then not only one house, but others went. Yeah. yeah, but then fortunately they said they were able to lift him away, mm. sort of yank him out of the scene, and they couldn't save the house, but, no, but he wasn't injured and nobody else was injured, so they feel very lucky yeah, that's about good. that. The Bushmen are a people, we could call them an Aboriginal people in Southern Africa. They've lived here for a very long time. Archaeologically, they can be traced back for 40,000 years. There are many different language groups. Uh, the particular language group that we're working with are the Kung people. Uh, they, for many years, they've been known uh, in the literature as the Kung Bushmen or the Kung San. But recently, uh, as they've come to their political consciousness, they have made the point that since their word in their own language for themselves is Junkwasi, which means real people, that's the name they would like to be known by, so we call them the Junkwasi. The musical bow is one of the oldest surviving instruments in Bushman music. Variations of the bow have been used to create musical sounds for as long as the Bushmen have been hunters. By day they use it to hunt, but in the evenings they use it to make music. This particular instrument is not one of the hunting bows, its function is strictly musical. change the sounds that goes da, 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 da. how do you how do you change it from your mouth look at them say do the manika you saw this voice with can can you show me what 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 you do is it do you put it in your mouth right and then and then do you move what what do you move here your teeth and tongue teeth and tongue what when you move here th with the with your thumb what does that do <coughs> also change the sound can can you what would happen if you don't do it 
Can you show me if you don't do it? And then tell to see the difference in sound. Now, can you try it with 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 moving it? Okay, now try not doing it for a second. No one really knows how old this music is. I tried asking one of the Bushmen, but all he would say was that it came from his father, and that his father got it from his father. So how old could it be? Well, of course, you know, we have no real way of knowing that, but there are some interesting clues. Uh, sound doesn't preserve the way rock art does, but there are rock art depictions in South Africa and other parts of Africa that um, archaeologists are convinced that they represent trance dancing. And some of them look remarkably like uh, the trance dances you see, you'll see uh, here in the 90s. And um, so that suggests that that musical tradition goes back at least several thousand years. <laughs> I felt a little awkward about playing my instrument in front of these people. It has such a booming sound, more appropriate to the concert hall than this intimate setting where music is not performed. It just happens. Bach sounds so young here. 300-year-old music is old by my standards, but compared with the Bushman's cultural history, it's little more than an instant. putting my, my own cultural values to the test. By coming here, I think we all accumulate a lot of baggage as, as you know, get older, uh, values. For me, it's, you know, my parents who are Chinese origin, my, uh, even some French values because I was born there and uh, American values because I was educated there and I lived there. And each culture has a different, very different set of values. And it's, uh, it's what makes people uh, interesting. And I think uh, always my fascination with, with music is the fascination with people. <laughs> because just from seeing somebody different, you actually realize a little bit more uh, how you resonate to the differences. And I think this is probably the greatest stretch I've ever made. I don't know this language. They don't know uh, or particularly care who I am, what I do. And so it, it is very much putting everything that I think I value and care about to the test to see whether the, it, it is in any way intrinsically communicative. In Western culture, a musical instrument is a thing of beauty. It's something of value, and that value tends to define your relationship to it. 
For the Bushmen, it's nothing more than a device for producing sound. Its appearance isn't important. So an instrument like this Venturo uses nothing more than an old oil can for a sound box. Here in the village of Namchoha is a man whose reputation is enormous. He's called Pai, and his students travel great distances to learn from him. It didn't take me long to understand why this man is regarded so highly. He's a great musician. Can I, can you show me how it works? I'm cold. I don't, I don't want me, me say, me do say, uh, uh, go ahead, coach. Uh, go ahead, me say, uh, Mm. Uh, Mm. 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 Does he have to press hard? Huh. Ask, can I you ask him? <laughs> I can't do it. <coughs> Can he draw this bow? Can, can, can you do that? Show me. Show me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think part of my difficulty came from the fact that although the principle of drawing a bow across a metal string is the same for the venturo as it is for the cello, the actual method of producing the sound is entirely different. These materials demand a very different feel to produce the harmonics. Mm, wonderful. <laughs> so, okay, now this is... <laughs> I see. <laughs> Okay, now, I'm beginning to understand, but tell Tao that th the sound that he makes is so much more beautiful. <laughs> After my not too successful attempts at playing the Venturo, I felt a little more relaxed with the villages of Namchoha. But while Kai was willing to teach me the rudiments of his instrument, he seemed curiously reluctant to try my cello. There's a natural shyness about these people, although it was clear that the whole village wanted to see what their man could do with my instrument. I'm <laughs> 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 Hey. <laughs> 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 
star pupils. They live 20 miles apart, but whenever these two musicians meet, they will sing and play together throughout the night. notion of the Bushman as one of the last of the uncorrupted civilizations, the noble savage, a throwback to our primitive origins. But in coming here, I found something quite different. These people are survivors. They know how to adapt because their future depends on it. Today, the Bushmen are confined to a tiny corner of the land that they once occupied, and it's made them even more aware of their own continuity. There's now a self-governing cooperative, which makes all the decisions within the community. This film would not have been possible without their agreement. One of the co-op's ventures is this mobile shop, which enables the villagers to sell their handicrafts for cash, a new concept, so that they can buy vital commodities like sugar and flour, tobacco, blankets, and soap powder. <laughs> There's a thriving education program, too. Here in Kalkoba, I watch children learning to read and write in English as well as in their own language. Singing and dancing are part of everyday life, but there's no formal musical training in the classroom. So I was surprised at how quickly these children and their teachers could adapt to completely foreign musical instruments like the recorders and tin whistles I brought along with me. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, okay. Um, this is a song about a, a tree that's lost all its branches, lost all its leaves. And a person could be walking <coughs> along and he look ahead and he say, is that a person? Is that a person I see up ahead? No, it's not. It's just a tree stripped of all its branches and leaves. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> What I've always tried to look for everywhere is is sort of not what separates us from other people, but sort of what we have in common, to find a common humanity. And as far as music is concerned, I do know it's very, music is from every culture is tied to its language in some way. Ask him whether this sounds like a butterfly. Yeah, I know. Is music a universal language? I think it still is a universal language if people try and approach the language from the inside and with respect. Like, does it sound like a flying thing? Yeah. He said, did you say that was a butterfly? He said, that's, it sounds yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like that. Yeah. And, but sometimes... I when people make the effort and are, in fact, curious and open and respectful, um, the possibilities are immense to figure out why someone chooses to use a certain sound or wants to play this at a certain time. And um, I think there there's so many layers that, that can connect between people um, if they just try. <laughs> Bushman music, like their stories, is passed on from one generation to another through word of mouth. Nothing is written down. My musical training, on the other hand, is based on notation, so the only way for me to capture something of the melody and structure of this music played on the guashi is to write it down note by note. Okay. Now, so. Da, 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 da. Uh, okay, can you play the whole thing? Say do, say do, chingwa.
Okay, now, what is the first note? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, I have. He's changed it again, so yeah. I. It's like the stories. Yeah, yeah. Each time, it's different, but yet there's something that makes it the same each time. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, so. Uh -huh. Let me just try again. I will not give up. I say do. Because right now I have. You know, it's like I don't know where he starts. Kaja, you like that? You, you like that? Kaja. Mm -mm. Hey, He's wondering what yeah. your problem is because it sounds great to him. Oh, I see. And, okay. Um, I'm wondering if it's that you're expecting an exact, an exact sequence of right. notes uh -huh. when yeah. he is part of the fl part right. of the flavor of it is yeah. that it's. You know, th it's only ninety percent the same. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? That's that's exactly. Yeah. So that there's something. You know, the way that that we would have chords, yeah. and then you improvise on them. Right. But you see, I think we have here um, uh, intervals uh -huh. and certain rhythmic things. <laughs> Uh-huh. Uh, so there are a number of possibilities, mm -hmm. I think. This mm -hmm. is like modular, you know? Yeah. Okay. So you're into it. Yeah, I think in it. it's like, yeah, the, I, I, it's it's same certain types of intervals, mm -hmm. yeah. certain types of motifs. But it's free in terms of how yeah. that's going to come in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. and then he comes. Yeah. Thank you. I I think I finally yeah. understood something yeah. about it. Once again, what we have is yeah. few 
absolutely set things, you know, five strings, mm -hmm. a certain number of permutations. But within those permutations, infinite variety. Mm -hmm. The rhythms of this melon dance are complex, yet these children have no difficulty in setting up a series of intricate cross rhythms to accompany their elaborate game of catch. It's something I could probably learn to do, but they do it instinctively. not peculiar to Bushman land. It's found among other tribal groups across Africa. But what makes it different from other instruments the Bushmen use is the fact that it is played by men, women, and children alike. That doesn't mean, however, that it's any easier than the guashi or the venturo. In trying to play it, I realized, like any other instrument, it takes time to develop fluency. Okay, so where's the F? <laughs> Shoot. Where the hell is he at? There we go. <laughs> Shoot. Are you interested in passing on what you know uh, to other people? Carl had told me that, um, that he learned from his father's 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 father uh, the music came down. Yeah. So are you ever worried then that, that if a father doesn't pass it on to mm -hmm. a child, then the music might get lost? Uh-huh. Oh. Yeah. I see, you know, I see what you're saying. Are you, are we, I asked, are you concerned that mm -hmm, this mm -hmm, might not be mm -hmm. passed on? Mm -hmm. But he says, you know, the young people today, some of them uh, go off, they're doing jobs, they're traveling around, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they come back and they think, oh, what is it that my father has? Mm. What is it that my father is doing? Mm. Yeah, what I want, how can I do that? high point of the Bushmen's collective music making, a synthesis of their music, their beliefs, and their medicine. To the Bushmen, the trance dance is a gift from heaven. Its origins are buried in ancient history, but if the cave paintings of trance dancing have been accurately dated as 40,000 years old, then what I am seeing is one of the oldest human rituals known to man.
The choice of the dancers is dictated by the women in the group, but it is generally the men, and often the musicians, who dance until one of them goes into trance. Every song is about an animal or a bird, and at the onset of trance, the spirit of the creature enters the body of the dancer, enabling him to reach a transcendental state. I can only speak for myself, but I think that the cumulative power of a trance dance is as great as a Beethoven symphony or a Stravinsky ballet. But that doesn't mean that that music will be liked by everybody, because just the way that Stravinsky and Beethoven are not liked by everybody, it's you have to actually listen for it and and if you start to appreciate the, the subtleties or whatever, I think it really, it fulfills, I think, in that sense, this, the same function of a Beethoven symphony. In one of the interviews we had with some of the women who were participating in the trance dance, I think they were asked, why do you do trance dancing? And I think their answer was great. It gives us life. I think... In that sense, um, Beethoven's Ninth, at its best, is nourishment for the soul. The trance dance is nourishment for the soul. And, it's, and for all the participants, which means literally the whole community, they all know what it's about. They all know that there's a tremendous power there. <laughs> I realized that people don't perform their music. They don't present it. You know, eight o'clock, Tuesday night, you start. It just happens. And then people either join in, or they stop, or they tune, or they smoke. And it's just, it's a very natural thing. I think it encourages me to have more faith in not having to make something happen. Here, timing is not important in terms of when something starts. In fact, trying to, to practice here was very difficult at first because I felt really out of place. I thought, you know, I don't belong here. I shouldn't be doing any of this. But gradually, I found that some of the pieces that I was playing around um, I could find resonance here. Um, if it's courtly music, maybe you look for another part of, of another layer in the courtly music that speaks at the right level here. I mean, it, it has stretched me. So I think in a specific way, yes, I'm, I'm going to try and play different kinds of music as a result of coming here. I think there's definitely been a stretch uh, of realizing the power of, of what can come from the land. It just opens you up in every way, uh, but specifically orally for me, uh, to, to know that some things that I might have heard before that sounds ordinary, but that if I know it has a sp specific meaning here, um, it becomes very special.
At heart, all men, men want to be more aware of themselves and to live more creatively. Because man really, ultimately, what makes him happy is not having more things, but feeling that he's got a life of meaning. Right. And this is what seemed to me so moving about these people in Africa with absolutely nothing in our sense of the word, and yet have everything. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that the moment one entered this world of theirs, it, it, uh, there, were, there was no difference, really, and there was a great sense of homecoming and enrichment. And I've had my life, I've not done it deliberately, but I've had to, I've spent a lot of my life in different countries in Africa, different countries in Europe, I be, and I've experienced America, and I've uh, uh, lived in India, mm -hmm. Indonesia, mm -hmm. and a bit, bit of China, and a lot of Japan. Mm -hmm. And I've never yet been to a place where I felt a stranger. I never have. I found uh, that there was, once I could just pick up everywhere, there was a great welcome in that culture and a great preparedness. Right. If only I could see it. There was a bridge. Mm -hmm. If only I would cross it. Mm -hmm. And that's what cultures are. They should be bridges. And there's a trouble about the world. The world is full of bridges, but people won't cross them. Right. They treat them as barriers. Okay. Uh, <laughs> 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 